Hello, I'm Jana Peterson. In today's busy world, new technologies and techniques continue to evolve, changing every aspect of our lives. Carpentry practices have also advanced tremendously, and building today is more complex than even a decade ago. Now, we all value quality, but these craftsmen who bring their training and expertise to every project also have to think about environmental and energy concerns as well. Today on Built to Last, we're going to talk with some of these craftsmen and find out what it's like to build in the new millennium. Built to Last is sponsored by Unico Incorporated, manufacturers of the small duct high velocity HVAC Unico system. Unico is dedicated to the environment and has been serving residential and commercial customers around the corner and around the globe for more than 25 years. Great Northern Lumber, providing green construction materials from skyscrapers to residential remodel. Proud to serve you for the last 27 years and into the future in the lumber industry. Woodworking has been around for thousands of years, but carpentry as a craft has only been seen as a true profession in the last 500 years when it became a respected field during the Middle Ages. Those craftsmen were able to pass along their trades from generation to generation. Younger generations could see the work and expertise of their forefathers and then add a little bit of themselves to the ever-changing world of carpentry. Trade guilds further evolved in the United States with the advent of the first Carpenters Union in Chicago in 1881. The goal was to organize workers for better working conditions and better safety practices. Many of today's carpenters come from generations of these workers with the same commitment to skill and tradition. What is a carpenter? A carpenter is the person who constructs, installs, and maintains single and multifamily dwellings, bridges, highways, and high-rise buildings from a wide range of tools and materials. Other trades handle the mechanical parts of the building. Carpenters are professional craft workers that work with wood and light gauge metal for building structures, concrete formwork, and exterior and interior trim. Everyone has heard the story of Joseph, Mary, and Jesus. Joseph was a carpenter, which was a term that was common at the time of the writings of the Bible. Artisans, including carpenters, were forming worker guilds since 300 AD. These groups were called guilds for the gold deposited in their common funds. Carpenters have been recognized as a trade group since the 1200s. That was when formal training in guilds was established with apprentices living within a master carpenter's house. The apprentices would work for a number of years before being released as a journeyman. After a journeyman had proven himself to the guild, he would become a master and work for himself and eventually take on his own apprentices. The European carpentry trade moved to America with the first settlers, some of them being ship carpenters that decided to stay in the new land. In the mid-1800s, guilds were giving way to unions. Today's Carpenters Union was formed on August 11, 1881, and Carpenter Local No. 1 is still located in downtown Chicago. In 1889, the Chicago District Council was formed, and an apprentice system was originated in 1901. The common slogan at the time was eight hours for work, eight hours for play, and eight hours for sleep. The carpenters were hit hard during the Great Depression. It wasn't until World War II, where the war-driven building demand and the general post-war prosperity finally provided American carpenters with reasonable opportunities and greater financial security. Since then, there have been huge strides in technology and safety, letting carpenters work faster and more efficiently, while also being able to work longer than ever before. 
This, combined with material advancements, allowed for construction at levels that would have been unthinkable only a few decades before. The rule, the compass, and the jack plane. Those were the, probably the three most important tools. There were a lot of other tools in, involved. Uh, the saws, the chisels, uh, but to lay out and to build, you needed to have the ruler, you needed to have the compass, you needed to have the jack plane. Carpentry has evolved to specialization. Back in the old days, carpenters did everything. You would build the building, you'd trim out the building, you'd roof the building, side the building. Uh, nowadays, you've got specialization. So in our regional council, we have general carpentry, cabinet making, floor covering, we have metal lathing, we have mill rights, and several other specialty trades, shingling, siding, insulating, and drywall. So nowadays, everything is specialized. Well, basically, there wasn't much safety. I mean, uh, if you've slid off a roof, you got up and climbed up the ladder again and went back to work. While they were building the museum downtown in Chicago, putting up those pillars that workers, you would actually every once in a while see a worker falling down from the scaffolding that they were working on. Uh, and nobody would stop, they just continue to work. They knew based on how high they were going with that structure, how many people they would kill on that job, and it was acceptable. Today, it's not acceptable. They have classes, OSHA classes they make you take, a certain amount of hours, I think it was four hours OSHA, they teach you fall protection, and all the teachers emphasize safety. Some of these uh, young apprentices will probably be real old <laughs> before they retire. Carpenters take great pride in the work they do, and it all stems from the skill they've acquired through years of experience and training. As technological improvements improve efficiency, they also help to reduce the amount of labor that's needed for a particular task. And because of that, new advances can sometimes be seen as a double-edged sword. So what does this all mean for a labor-based industry? Well, it means adapting age-old skills of craft to 21st century tools. But remember, there are some things that can never be replaced by technology. And that forms the basic identity of a skilled tradesman. We all start somewhere uh, with whatever basic skill sets you bring to a job set and then as we go from our first day to our second day we build on those skill sets and we learn and we evolve and we work into a crew and, uh, and we become more productive as time goes on. Um, and with those skill sets and with that experience then we see all of a sudden new materials coming on a job site, and new products and with those new materials and products um, might come warranties and from the manufacturer and the warranties are only good if the installation was done by a person trained in that particular product. That being said, it's important for us to remember that I, I mentioned we, we build on a, on a foundation. Uh, we start with some skill sets and those skill sets are older older than all of us. I mean, we go way back when in history uh, to hear about uh, guilds and apprenticeships and, uh, and training um, for, for as long as, as man is, I'm sure, has been around. Uh, we've been teaching each other. And some of the skills learned back then are still in use today. It's just that some of the products and some of the ways we do them have changed. Here we have a block of wood. And even though it looks like a simple, it looks like a simple block of wood, when I turn it around, this product was handcrafted. It was hand carved into the flat block of wood that we saw on the other side. It was the same on this side, and and this is quite a skill. This is quite an art. I have right here uh, a fine example of hand carving and what might be found actually in some uh, older buildings. All of the old buildings that we have standing, whether they're fine residential homes, uh, office buildings, even newer buildings, um, 
have some type of, of, of fine craftsmanship involved. And um, some, of the, um, some of the buildings have a lot of wood work in them and um, crown moldings, built-in bookshelves, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if there are some of the older buildings that had a lot of hand-carved moldings in it and an addition is put on that building, where do we get someone, how do we duplicate that molding for the addition? Uh, if something gets damaged because of a fire or, or some accident, how do we replace that molding? So some of the skills, the old skills, still are, are vital. The latest and greatest, I'd like to say one of the latest and greatest is total station technology, layout technology, where you go onto a job site and it's just a, just a hunk of ground <laughs> and, and somebody has to go on that job site and locate where that building's got to be. In, in this room we have a table, the table has corners. The corners are located somewhere in this room, correct? So a building is located somewhere on the job site. And that somewhere is input into a data collector, which is then uploaded into a total station for laying out. And, uh, and it, it just eliminates so much of the old fashioned, let's pull a tape, let's get a, let's get a dry line, let's get a, a, a builder's level, uh, and, and just combines all of that technology into one. An artist may paint something on a piece of canvas. A sculptor may mold something out of clay. But for carpenters, wood has been their traditional medium of choice. In fact, timber from felled trees was once the only medium carpenters had to construct their world. And it's gone through several enhancements throughout the years to keep it competitive with other emerging materials. Wood is still the preferred choice in many residential settings because people are attracted to its warmth and allure. And now today, wood has been engineered to be uniform, and carpenters can use it to build buildings that will last even longer. The main difference is, is back, the houses were smaller. Uh, there was not as much engineering in the houses 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago as there is today because of these new products that, that uh, for both for spaces, both for uh, hurricanes or tornadoes, they're all designed for this. 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, it was conventional framing. Everything was, uh, was out of real wood. Um, and it worked and it lasted and it kept going. Um, the older style homes, the, the species that they used, uh, didn't utilize the logs as well as the, the, the new technology today. There was a lot more waste, so I guess greener building, if there's a catchphrase today, uh, is much more prevalent by the products we use today than in the past. Well, the most common forms in the past uh, were solid sawn, uh, solid wood members, uh, mainly out of spruce or Douglas fir. Uh, over the years, uh, we've changed to composites or engineered wood where uh, they utilize the trees and the fibers in a much better way, use 100% of the trees. Uh, it's allowed for your bigger homes, your bigger spanses, instead of taking a solid wood beam from an old growth tree, they're able to manufacture it from smaller trees, from smaller strands uh, with the new technology around today. Your most common one would be OSB, which is oriented strand board, which is panels uh, they use for roof sheeting, for walls. Uh, back 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, they would use planks or plywood. Uh, they can use OSB. They actually grow uh, trees on a plantation for OSB, and they harvest them. And, and you can use uh, different species that maybe would not be as desirable in conventional framing. Uh, they're able to use the fiber out of these other trees and press the strands together to make a structural panel out of it. Uh, your paralams uh, and timber strand, uh, which are more of a beam assembly, uh, they make three and a half inch wide, five and a quarter inch wide beams that run 48 feet long if necessary, that uh, uh, carry all the roof loads, you know, houses based on loads. Uh, it enables you to have an, the open spaces we've seen in the houses today. There's not a lot of columns or beams or pillars as you've seen 20 or 30 years ago. 
and these and this product allows uh, the architects to design open spaces. Uh, the engineering and the, and the modern technology does make a, a lot better. It's more consistent. It's more uniform. Uh, the solid sawn lumber had a tendency to sometimes twist or warp or split or crack. Uh, the, the engineered and the composites uh, are, are actually engineered to a specific size with, with tolerances. Uh, they stay straighter. Uh, they don't shrink. They don't swell as much as the old solid sawn pieces did. Basically, uh, the materials that we use in our design are defined by the builder's scope of work and specifications. We take those materials and with our design input, um, design them for the best plant fabrication, shipping, and most importantly, the field installation of the product. At R&D Field, in the 22 years that I've been here, um, things have evolved from a lumber list given to a foreman. Um, actually, the foreman, in my opinion, has been brought inside as a, a designer, um, specifying the window rough openings and leading the layout of the building and the joist uh, from inside the building. So when it gets to the field, it, everything lines up with the plumbing and there's no interference or job conditions, really. It's uh, designed on the computers and the problems are met up front versus on site. The value of a home has always been in the comfort it's provided to the homeowner, but buildings were primarily constructed to shelter us from the environment. For hundreds of years, that's exactly what they've done, often effectively, but not always efficiently. As towns and cities grew and the number of homes and buildings began to expand, the environment started to feel a little bit like it was left out in the cold because the building boom drained many of our natural resources with little regard for the effect on the environment. Today, new organizations have sprung up to help the environment and the construction industry live symbiotically. In fact, carpenters and contractors have special guides in place that help them build buildings to reduce energy use, therefore helping the homeowner and the environment. The U.S. The US Green Building Council is an internationally known uh, nonprofit member organization focused on sustainability, green buildings, and not just new construction, but existing and operations of, and maintenance of existing buildings. The USGBC has set a standard known as LEED, Leaders in Environmental and Energy Design. What it is is a set of specifications to design and to build a high performance building. We're just basically, you're, you're giving, you're getting a report card on the product that you're installing. Carpenters have always uh, had the most highly trained individuals in the industry and you know this is now we can back it up with you know all the state-of-the-art uh, technology to have to show that this is the difference. And to do so it, we have mandates or specifications I should say for for every phase of construction and what will that come into play is how we handle all, all, all aspects, uh, how we handle our waste, what materials that we use, where do these materials come from, uh, what are these materials made of, and what about the indoor air quality. The bottom line is we got to stop utilizing natural resources, replenishing what we use and utilize composite materials, know how these uh, composite materials are installed um, per the manufacturer's recommendation. But the best return on investment is what our carpenters can offer and that is tightening the envelope of a building. If you can tighten that envelope, make that, that building a more insulated and tighter building, that would be the key way to go about it and its biggest return on a dollar and that's what's most important. Bottom line is I want my grandkids to be able to have what we have. We have a perfect opportunity to make a change, but it's awareness. It's not just in the construction industry, you know, it's global. Well, now we know the criteria of a green building, so as a general contractor, we look at um, all these areas a little differently than we did before. It's a sort of a menu system, and it's broken up into five areas of sustainability. One is the site or environmental concerns. Uh, the second is water, water reduction. And uh, third is energy and energy conservation, then material resources. And then the last one would be interior air quality and improving that. 
So you get points based on which one's strategies you pick in those five general areas. In the area of energy, uh, we'll look at uh, geothermal and uh, photovoltaics, um, heat recovery systems, high efficiency lighting, all those sorts of things. And what most people want to know from us is, um, does it cost more? And secondly, if it does cost more, is there any return for it? Say, in energy, by saving energy, how much will I save a year, and how long will it take me to recover my investment uh, to begin with? And therefore, they'll make a, a value judgment on that, whether they want to incorporate uh, that energy efficiency into the project uh, or not. Basically, um, with regards to energy, we look at how the building is going to be used, uh, who's going to be occupying the building, times of day, um, what would be most efficient type of systems that would meet the needs of that building to function those proper ways as far as the selection of the systems, uh, whether electric, gas, what makes most efficiency for them. Basically, the way we approach a project, whether it's residential or commercial, um, basically we meet with the owner find out what their needs are, how they, if it's residential, you know, what are they looking for? Is this their forever home? Is this their home that they're looking for something five years and then they're going to retire? Is this something that their family is going to grow into? So up front we find out what's the potential, what are they looking for, what are they trying to achieve in this home, and what what are they able to work with? Um, what's their budget? What's their projected, you know, growth or what's how big of a house they're looking for? And the same thing with commercial, we look at something we're designing a building, this is their building for five years, ten years, do they have potential growth, do they want to build that into the project up front, even selecting a site is a site where we can add on and expand into the future or is this you know what the requirements are now and they will never grow. So there's a lot of research and talk and discussions that are done up front just to find out what are the requirements and you know where will we go from there. Today we are um, making an analysis of this house, see how well uh, the air flowed through the house and compared to the uh, uh, region where we are. We can pressurize the house by putting, reversing the fan, throwing air from the uh, outside to the house, okay? Or we depressurize the house by throwing the air out of the house and measure what's the, um, cubic feet per minute the airflow travels through the house. Once we determine that there is uh, problems with the air ventilation or air circulation through the house and we lose a lot of heat in the winter time, we can also determine if the uh, heat and the water heat, smaller appliances uh, are burning the combustion uh, energy correctly, complete or, or incomplete. We let the owner know if he has any problems with the way that uh, heat is, is um, uh, put together with the house uh, and if there is some uh, adjustment that need to be done and that uh, with the appliances we let, we let her know and then I will show her how she can save if she uh, uh, agrees to do some of the things like for the things that I saw in here just about the insulation. If the insulation is replaced, obviously she will be able to save uh, some money on, you know, uh, electricity or gas. Well, I'd say uh, in the area, uh, we built an interpretive center out for the village of, uh, of Glenview. And one of the strategies, that was a net zero energy building uh, where uh, they were, they balanced it out so that they'd be pumping as much energy out into the grid as they were consuming. And uh, they used photovoltaics and uh, a geothermal heat pump. And when we ran the analysis, the cost, the premium, the additional cost for the geothermal system versus what it was saving annually, it came out to a 24% return on investment, which means that over a four-year period, the savings from that additional cost would have paid for it. And then every year after that, that was just money being returned to the village of uh, Glenview for municipal concerns. 
We've made strides in every endeavor, continuing to look for ways to do things better, faster, and to last longer. The quest for constant improvement is always ongoing, ready to build upon advances we already have, and prepared to accommodate new technologies of the future, all while maintaining that special commitment to the craft and skill. Now it's with these principles that we tackle every kind of job between the homeowners, contractors, and carpenters alike. They all work together to build a home or a building that's something special, something that's built to last. Thanks for watching. I'm Jana Peterson, and I'll see you next time right here on Built to Last. Visit the Built to Last website to learn about these topics and more. Built to Last is sponsored by Unico Incorporated, manufacturers of the small duct high velocity HVAC Unico system. Unico is dedicated to the environment and has been serving residential and commercial customers around the corner and around the globe for more than 25 years. Great Northern Lumber, providing green construction materials from skyscrapers to residential remodel. Proud to serve you for the last 27 years and into the future in the lumber industry.